Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first breakout session of Hear Me, See Me, the 2021 Equity in Missouri Higher Education Summit. I'm Alicia Erickson. I'm a senior research analyst here at the Missouri Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development. I have the pleasure of being the moderator for this presentation by my colleagues at St. Louis University. Before we get started, I would like to just remind you of a couple housekeeping items. All participants should stay muted to eliminate background noise. We want to see your faces. If you have a camera, please turn it on to better engage with us. All presentations are live, so please bear with us for any technical issues. The chat will be monitored for questions throughout the presentations. Um, all sessions will be recorded so that you'll be able to access them after the conference. And don't forget to engage with us on social media using Equity 2021 at M-O-D-H-E-W-D. Now um, I will turn it over to our presenter and we hope you enjoy this session. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me this morning. Um, really excited to talk with you all and present, uh, hopefully spawn some conversation here. Uh, I will apologize in advance. My six month old son is home with me and in the background. So if he starts to screech or anything, uh, please, please forgive the intrusion. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm very excited to talk with you all. My name is Evan Reinsmith and we're going to be talking about uh, alleviating the administrative burdens for low-income students through ACT exam access and post-secondary education engagement here in the state of Missouri. So, as I said, I'm Evan Ryan Smith. I'm the executive director of the St. Louis University Prime Center. Uh, some of you may have heard of us, others probably have not. So I'll just give you a, a brief background on what the Prime Center is. So what is this? We are an independent nonpartisan research center that is housed in the School of Education at St. Louis University. Um, just got a chat notice that folks can't hear. Are people able to hear me okay? Looks like we got thumbs up from a couple folks. So I'm just gonna keep going and hopefully we can get that figured out. So uh, we opened in the spring of 2019. While we have a strong bend towards K-12 education, we do uh, focus on post-secondary access and success, and we are entirely focused on education research in the state of Missouri. We consist of a full-time team of researchers, a couple of graduate and undergraduate research assistants, and a team of affiliated researchers focused on helping to make education research and data uh, more accessible and, use and usable for decision makers in the state of Missouri, be that educators, school district leaders, uh, university uh, employees, and legislators across the state. Our goal is really to make this uh, very fun conversation around education, research, and data just more accessible. And you can follow along with us on Twitter, go to our website, scan the QR code, it'll take you right to it. So let's get started on the uh, topic at hand today which is on Missouri's ACT participation and some of the policy history that we have. Uh, we'll talk about research on state funded college admissions testing, because that's really the focus of Missouri's ACT history that we're discussing today. And then looking at how Missouri's policy uh, approach altered test participation and performance uh, for a brief stint of time back in the uh, 20 teens. And then we'll finish up by talking about some of our next steps for research and uh, where we hope to go going forward. So, as uh, Commissioner Mulligan mentioned this morning uh, briefly, the Missouri's big goal for higher education uh, stated in 2011, the real crux of this goal was to increase post-secondary attainment for Missourians to have 60% of our statewide adult population uh, holding at least a, a uh, post-secondary certificate of some kind uh, by the year 2025. We are quickly approaching that deadline. Um, we'll see if we've reached that goal. Um, but one strategy to reach that 60% attainment rate was to improve access and equity for uh, ACT exam participation. Uh, the state funded ACT participation for all 11th grade students, be that uh, public school students, private school students, homeschooled students. Uh, the state wanted to give everyone access to the ACT exam. And the first state, uh, the first test began during the 2015-16 school year where students were able to take the test at their uh, home, uh, their district assigned school, and it was during a school day. This was not a unique policy 
by any stretch of the imagination for Missouri. Um, in 2019, 15 states had reported near 100% participation in the ACT for their graduating class that year. Uh, usually on the on the back of some state finance to support participation. Not only the ACT, but we had 10 states and the District of Columbia that were administering the SAT at no cost to students. Um, so obviously, about half of the states in the country were making a, a college entrance exam readily available for all of its high school students. In Missouri, interestingly enough, we had three years of our program. Uh, this makes us the first state by our research to implement and then subsequently remove a state funded free testing policy. Um, there has been one alternative approach, which is South Carolina. They altered their approach to offer the ACT work keys in addition to the standard ACT um, as an additional test option. Um, as some students really had no interest in attending a post secondary institution, they wanted to get some sort of job training, and the ACT work keys is better um, associated with. Uh, measuring career readiness rather than uh, the college and career readiness side that we hear so often with ACT. So our approach today is really going to be talking about this ACT policy, both the implementation and the subsequent removal of funding to implement this policy. A couple of reasons why this might work for helping more students engage with post-secondary education. While it's not seemingly very expensive with $50 for a, a test. Uh, this does represent a very vital step to access uh, post-secondary education. And that $50 for some, um, while that seems small for some, it's quite a big dent in the pockets of some students, um, especially for such an important step in the process of enrolling in post-secondary education. So removing that burden can be a very important piece, especially for low-income students. Additionally, students in the uh, test mandate uh, states complete the exam over the course of a normal weekday. So uh, there's no Saturday testing, which I had to do when I was in school uh, full head of hair ago. Um, so students just got to show up at school one day and it was test day. So that that was what was going on for that morning. Um, additionally, by implementing a state mandated test and allowing it during the school day, it removes the time and cost constraints that many students Face. So, if you have a weekend job or an afternoon job, or you just don't have transportation to get you to the testing site, because that's often what would happen. Um, not every student's home high school or school location is serving as a testing site for the ACT. So, they would have to travel to that day. Sometimes they have to ask off work, that sort of thing. So, this is a way to remove some of those access barriers. Finally, completing the ACT might provide students with some helpful information about whether or not they're competitive to be enrolled in post-secondary admission. Uh, if you can't take the test, you don't know if you're ready or not, or if you would be qualified to get admitted into uh, post-secondary education. So this is just a way to kind of cast a broader net and open the door for more students. Um, so that's some of the, the idea behind why these state mandated testing policies might work for post-secondary engagement. As I said, we're not the first state to implement this. In fact, several states have been doing this since the early 2000s. Um, and we have a growing body of research that evaluates um, some of these policies. Uh, the research from CLASIC looking at Colorado, Illinois, and Maine, finding that there wasn't really an overall change in participation rate for the state of Maine. There was a pretty significant increase in the state of Illinois. And interestingly enough, when students were able to take this test on their own, it shifted some students from a two-year institution to a four-year institution as their first choice, um, sometimes signaling that they might have been a little bit more ready for that so they could uh, make a, a better informed decision on what institution might be a better fit or where they could be successful. Another study was a national focus on SAT dominant states and looking at a couple of individual district policies from Bowman in 2015. Interestingly enough, when they increased access to testing, it ended up increasing the percentage of students who ultimately graduated from college. Um, really important finding there. Um, this next study from Hurwitz, which I would argue is one of the more important uh, examples of, from research for our state, is that it found by increasing uh, college entrance exam access, there was, again, 
increase in attending a four year institution and it did increase the share of students who enrolled. And this was a very large impact. Specifically for students in more rural schools, which, as we have heard throughout some of the initial conversations this morning, the spatial aspect of equity for post secondary access and success is really important for the state of Missouri, especially with some of our more rural districts. A couple other studies um, study from Goodman again, finding an increase in enrollment at selective institutions when schools were able to implement uh, testing on site. And the last study in the state of Michigan, where schools were able to become their own testing site, did find a positive effect for students uh, who originally would have had a very low probability of taking the test without the state mandate in place. So low income students, students typically attending schools that don't have a high post secondary enrollment uh, trend leading up to this. We saw quite a few students in, in uh, Michigan who were able to access state testing were able to eventually enroll, um, which I think is a big, a big piece of this conversation. Just access on the front end can lead to better outcomes. So talking about Missouri here in this figure, we're showing the change in uh, participation rate for the state of Missouri, um, looking at 2015, the year right before the policy went into place, and then looking at the average participation rate between 2016 and 2018 when we had our policy. As you can see in 2015, about 63% of uh, graduates in the state of Missouri were participating in the ACT. So we have about 60,000 students who are graduating per year. So that's a good chunk of kids, 40,000 students already taking the test. However, when we increased, we jumped all the way up to 94% of students uh, participating in the ACT statewide. It is important to note that because we're casting a wider net, some students uh, were taking the test and just had no interest in college already. Um, we did see our score, our average statewide score decrease a little bit, which is not surprising, but I don't think is a good enough reason to say that we shouldn't be offering this test anymore, especially when you look at um, sort of that distribution where we had a big chunk of schools that were actually already uh, exceeding that 94% level and quite a few schools that were getting up to 100% participation. Um, in the period prior to this policy going into place, 2015, very few schools and districts that were exceeding 80% participation rates. Um, so I think this is a, a good example of what happened when we implemented this policy and how we increased access to what is arguably one of the biggest barriers and hurdles that students have to clear in order to uh, show some level of post-secondary engagement. So what happened when we removed the policy? Now in green, we continue to show this 2016-18, uh, the policy period participation rates. What happened the year that we took the policy away? Statewide participation dropped down to about 72%. So we started to fall back a little bit closer to our pre-period trends. We do still see several districts that continue to implement this policy on their own. Um, anecdotally, we hear that Parkway School District in the St. Louis region uh, as soon as the policy was announced to be taken away, they s stepped right up and said, we're going to continue this policy on our own and have uh, continued to fund it. So part of this conversation on increasing access really depends on who was able to gain access to the ACT as a result of this policy. So looking at some of our districts in the state that have the highest concentrations of free and reduced price lunch eligible students, which is our best proxy for socioeconomic need, at the K-12 level, we see in 2015, there was about a 15 to 20 percentage point gap between districts that had the lowest concentration of those high socioeconomic need students and the districts serving the highest concentrations of those students. Um, just over half of those districts, or excuse me, just over half of students in those high socioeconomic need districts were able to participate in the ACT. During the period that we had this state mandated and state funded policy in place, this gap shrunk to less than 5 percentage points. Our highest socioeconomic need districts were then able to access uh, the ACT themselves and more of their students were able to participate. So if we think back to some of the research that we saw, especially Michigan, where we saw these students who might not have been likely to participate without um, a policy like this in place. These students were then able to access post-secondary testing and entrance exams, which could have induced more of our students to enroll in post-secondary education. 
um, which is arguably one of the most important pieces of this whole conversation on equity. We want more of those students who uh, may not be able to afford this on their own to be able to access. Interestingly, and I think somewhat disappointingly and not surprisingly, when this policy was taken away in 2019, this gap increased again back to about 15 percentage points for our districts serving the highest concentrations of low income students compared to the districts serving the lowest concentrations of those students. So, in the absence of this policy, our highest need students were then losing access to one of the, one of the most important uh, first steps in accessing post secondary education. So, with that in mind, we're this is where I conclude my presentation and open it up to conversation. Clearly in the existing literature, there's an increased access that can improve outcomes, especially for low income, high achieving students. This really uh, became clear for rural areas as well, where we might have even less access um, than some other, other areas. Um, when Missouri implemented this policy, we did see a dramatic increase in participation rates, especially among the districts serving highest concentrations of our low income students. Conversely, when we removed the policy, this adversely impacted those districts uh, that benefited the most just by being able to access it. Um, budgets are very tight, especially in the post COVID area, uh, post COVID era, as districts are now having to uh, consider their approach to uh, winding down the pandemic's effect and then what's going to happen in the post pandemic period. Similar to some of the prior uh, statewide policy, some districts have opted to continue this policy at the local level using their own funds. Uh, several of our districts that have these high concentrations of low income students are now more aware of the fact that the ACT offers a waiver for low income students. So they're able to access this on their own. But now they have that administrative burden of completing the paperwork to be able to do so, which might decrease the access. So. Just some closing thoughts across the nation. We know that many colleges and universities are starting to adopt these test optional entrance exam admissions policies as a result of the pandemic. Here at St. Louis University, we've adopted this for the last couple of years, and it seems to be continuing for at least one more year going forward. But what happens post uh, pandemic period uh, remains to be seen. Many states are starting to um, adopt their own exam. Uh, California is a great example that announced they would no longer uh, require ACT or SAT uh, score to be submitted for access. Um, we are seeing some unintended consequences of that. UCLA just had to announce that they would just be increasing the number of students they're admitting as first time full time students. So it's a really important aspect to consider too. Um, and some of the evidence just so shows that this post secondary engagement through state mandated testing is really impactful for low income students. And this is a really important piece to can keep in mind as we consider future uh, policies that could impact these students. So thank you so much for your time. Please go to our website, follow us on Twitter if you want to see more information on K-12 and post-secondary research here in the state of Missouri. Thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Ryan Smith. Um, we appreciate you being here this morning and especially dealing with a family issue. So if you <laughs> need to go, uh, we understand that, but we do have a question in the chat and I will encourage anyone else who has a question or comment to please leave it in the chat. The 1st question we have is how will the move by post secondary institutions move toward test optional impact move moving toward test optional impact this issue. Yeah, that's a, a great question. I think that's a really difficult 1 for us to kind of project. Um, as districts are moving towards test optional, it's going to be really difficult to understand like preparation and that sort of thing. Anecdotally, I've heard some from some colleagues down in uh, Arkansas that while their institution has gone post uh, has gone uh, exam optional, their approach now is they're placing every student who does not submit uh, an entrance entrance exam as part of their admissions packet. They are placed automatically into remedial coursework, um, which is. Uh, near and dear to my heart because my uh, quick my first foray into post secondary research was on post secondary remediation policies and it's pretty clear in the research that that's not the best option for a lot of kids. If you can give me just one second, I'm gonna go grab my son real quick. <laughs> Please. <laughs> So 
So we now have a mascot joining us. <laughs> He is adorable. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure I fully answered the question on how that's going to uh, impact um, how admissions will be impacted by test optional. I, as I said, California is really starting to struggle with their approach um, just because they saw in the first year of moving towards that there was a, a widening gap in access especially to some of the more selective state institutions uh, berkeley being one ucla uh, where students who maybe lost access to their entrance exam suddenly uh, were being told they weren't prepared for those institutions so i think that it's a really tough conversation to have um, and it's going to be a really interesting process to see how it changes. We have other questions or comments. Okay, here's a um here's one in the comment in the chat. SLU went test optional last year. Are you suggesting that students who did not take an entrance exam were placed in remedial courses at SLU? At SLU, I am not sure on that one. Uh, that anecdote was from some colleagues down in the state of Arkansas who um, work specifically in the uh, college transitions program, which oversees all of their remedial coursework. Um, they were telling me that the policy this year has been any student who doesn't submit a uh, an exam score since that's the the policy that Arkansas has a place at a state level based on entrance exam score they're placed into remedial coursework um, at SLU uh, I do not believe that's the case that they're automatically placed into remedial courses as they have um, multiple measures in terms of measuring preparation for their students thank you for that question Other questions, comments? Um, seeing none and seeing that we have a <laughs> Nicholas who might need to move along oh, to something he's, else. I know, he just needed to be picked up. So. <laughs> <laughs> and well, we certainly get faces on the. Uh, on yeah, the that's when I'm, when probably I'm very uh, <laughs> engaging for him. Who are all these people? Um, okay, well, Dr. Reisman, thank you. Oh, okay, well, here's another one that has popped in. Can you speak to efforts to reinstate the policy in Missouri? Uh, I have not heard much uh, in the way of traction of getting this policy back in place at a state at the state level. Um, I know one of the things that precipitated this this policy being taken away in the first place is that it was seen as sort of like an expensive policy that led to a decrease in our overall average uh, ACT score. Um, in all honesty, it seems like the cost of this was $4 million, which is just, in my opinion, some, somewhat of a drop in the bucket from a K-12 budget that's over a billion dollars. Um, and based on what we saw just in our initial participation rate look, the students who are benefiting from this the most, it seems like not the best approach. Um, as I said, there have been several districts that have continued to do this on their own. Um, here in the St. Louis region, St. Louis Public Schools, Ferguson Florissant School District, uh, University City, several of the districts that if you look on DESE's website at uh, student demographics, you would see that they have 100% of their students who are FRL eligible. Uh, those districts are now taking advantage of the ACT waiver themselves to help their students take the test on their own. Um, I don't know that we'll see much traction until we get some better evidence of who was impacted. I'm giving a plug for the research that we're doing right now um, by this policy to see who, who was able to better access um, post-secondary education as a result of, of this policy going in place and then subsequently who lost access when it was taken away. 
Thank you. And we have another question that's come in. ACT seems to have put a hold on how their test addresses students from disadvantaged backgrounds that could potentially help students do better. Any thoughts on that? I believe you might be referencing, I think they call it their challenge index or something of, of that nature that they had uh, tried there for, for, I think, one year and then the pandemic hit and then they had to go to home testing and all those things. I think, um, I think what they're hoping to do down the road is probably reinstate that. They're now trying to balance the, the aspect of states moving away uh, from the test in general. So they have to to pivot very quickly. Um, I think taking any context on top of the test score is going to be very important. Um, so helping to better understand if a student scores a, a 22 on the ACT, which is above what ACT is deemed the college ready level, putting that 22 in the context of where that student has gone to school their entire life, I think is a really good approach. Um, and I think it, it will push institutions themselves into taking a more holistic view of their admissions policies as well. I know ACT has really struggled with um, what their suite of exams have been used for. I mean, their compass exam had been one of the most popular for course placement uh, for remedial courses in most states. They said that that is not what that test was meant for and got to the point where they just stopped making the test and making it available for institutions to use because they thought that was a complete misuse of their, uh, their exam. Thank you again for that. Those questions. These are really important questions, and I'm glad that it spawned some some conversation. Just a reminder that this session will be posted. A recording of the session will be posted online. I put the um, address of our conference landing page, and you can access further um, breakout sessions today and for the next two days at this Edge Events website. And we will have our recordings posted there as well. Um, any other questions or comments for Dr. Reinsmith? Otherwise, we will say thank you for your time this morning. And um, yeah, I have other oh, questions. There's my email address. If any other questions pop up and you're you might be a little shy or waiting for your coffee to kick in. Well, actually, we have another question that came in, so we still have a few minutes. If um, <laughs> would you advise a student who went to a disadvantaged high school who graduated with a 4.0 to still take the ACT? That's a great question, and to be honest, I'm, I don't feel well equipped to give a student um, that advice. My background is education policy research. I'm a quantitative quasi experimental uh, researcher who has gotten further and further away from my days of interacting with K 12 students. Um, I think it really just depends on where that student wants to go to school. Some institutions have really stuck to their guns of we want ACT or SAT scores to be submitted. If that's where that student needs wants to go, that's a sometimes that's a reality of, of what they they need to do. Um, that being said, if they are opposed to that approach and don't like an institution requiring them to do something that they don't agree with, that's a whole other conversation. Now that's a dangerous thing to say in the context of the pandemic at the moment. Uh, but I, I'm hoping that the academic side is a little bit different from the, uh, the health side. I think instead of hedging on that response, I think any time that a student can give more information to the institution that they are hoping to enroll in, the easier it will be for that institution to make um, a more informed decision on their fit for that institution. So I don't necessarily think it's a bad idea, but I'm also acutely aware of the limitations and what might prevent a student from a disadvantaged high school might not be able to access the ACT. So I think that is that is a reality that is really important. Thank you.
muted. Sorry. Kevin's response was more info. My sentiments exactly. Thank you. So, um, we are at time for this session and we'd like to thank you very much for your presentation this morning. We hope to see all of you at further breakout sessions today and for the next 2 days and, um. I think Dr. Ryan Smith left his email address if you'd like to follow up for with further questions or information. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye, Nicholas.